What's up everybody, Mitz here. Today we are doing a review of Distal. This is from at Real Place on YouTube. Hey, Real, thanks, dude. <laughs> Lurking the entire time? Nice, thank you, my dude. Oh, I really enjoyed your book, by the way, and there's lots of stuff in there that I think is really cool. You can go to playdisrpg.com, that's D-I-S-R-P-G.com, and check out this pretty cool looking uh, D20 system. I have a whole bunch of notes on this uh, that I'm gonna run through. This is gonna, it's not really a TLDR cause it's fairly, fairly long, uh, but I am just gonna kind of like rattle through things as I move through the PDF uh, and you guys can hang out. Uh, remember this is the alpha product, not the final product as well. So just to keep that in mind while we go through, I'm sure there's some real changes and other things that will be happening throughout the system. We'll start at the start. Uh, I love the art style. Just from the description and the feel of the uh, way it's described as you're kind of moving through the game, uh, it feels like this game is not specifically meant for one shots so much, or, or at least characters that you use once. It's meant for characters that are supposed to develop. Um, so you kind of want to keep the game same character for a while. Even if you do different one shot adventures, you actually kind of it makes you feel like you want to keep the same character and put that character through a different set of adventures as you travel through the system itself. I really like this. Uh, it's got steps to creating character, which is really cool. You can just basically flip through or work your way through everything. So I'm just gonna read through a couple of different things as we look through this character creation process. So uh, it seems as though the game Play focus uh, is on trials of trauma and hardship, which is a very serious tone. Um, so if you don't like a game with a very serious tone, then you might not like this so much. I'm sure you can, you know, keep it light and, and kind of like breezy, but for the majority of it, your character is going through hardships, which is what helps them level up and which helps them progress. Th there's a small thing that is mentioned later on here about uh, animal companions having plot armor. I think that's amazing. That's a very cool idea. Uh, animal companions having plot armor is great. Your animal companions shouldn't be affected in combat in any way, shape, or form. I don't know why I wrote this down before I wrote down the lineage of stuff, but anyway. Uh, the hidden condition adds stealth bonus to your DC, which makes sense because in combat you're still going to get noticed, most likely, but you're just less likely to get directly hit. I think adding stealth to the DC is really cool. It's a really cool way to kind of deal with it. All right, then we got lineages stuff. So at a quick glance at the character creation, Backgrounds seem more important than the class, which isn't necessarily bad. I think the backgrounds being very important is kind of part and parcel with this uh, TTRPG specifically, which, yeah, I think that's fine. Okay, lineages determines your lineage, so your species, I suppose. That determines your movement, determines your health pool, and determines one of your stats, which seems pretty fine. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It also gives you weapon proficiencies in specific weapons. You do get more later from other things as well, but you typically get like some kind of weapon proficiency from your lineage. I would prefer this tied to a more of a why you would be proficient with this. Um, so kind of maybe not in the lineage, but I'd actually prefer this to be from the background experience that you could choose a weapon from the background experience and not from the species. Cause again, it kind of ties your lineage to like all dwarves are good with hammers. Like it's like, maybe they're not like, uh, yeah, anyway. And you also get some kind of special ability uh, here for your lineage as well, which is pretty stock standard sort of stuff for most TTRPGs. There's a lot uh, of lineages, which is really cool. And there's more to come. Okay, writing the background. Random tables for writing backgrounds is amazing and I love it. It's great to see how simple the ideas are that can easily be taken and then expanded on by the players. So I think this is really, really cool. So there's like, a, there's a bunch of prompts that you can look at and use. Uh, and you can, if you can't think of anything, um, you can roll a d20. Uh, and if you can think of something, discuss with the DM what kind of benefits it'll give you. A lot of them have like three different things. So it's for example, uh, I grew up with a silver spoon. So you got plus one politics, plus one fortune, plus one in aristocrat cont and, a, and a plus one aristocrat contact. So you get contacts and stuff in this game as well. And then also, uh, and my days were spent hunting monsters. So you get plus one stealth, plus two to beasts, plus one weapon proficiency. So you get an extra weapon proficiency from hunting beasts. I became a cell sword. Has no mechanical benefit, but just interesting. Uh, the day I, I became a cell sword, the day I was revealed as a charlatan. Oh shit. Okay. 
you get plus one influence, plus one performance, plus one streetwise, plus one professional contact. So now you've got an aristocrat contact and a professional contact and a bunch of other skills. So I think it's really cool. I really like, I really like how like there's a bunch of different prompts and you get a bunch of different skills from your background. Uh, you get to basically write your own background uh, and get it kind of whatever skills you want to kind of fit into those things, which is really cool. Proficiency ranks is simple and easy to understand and the same for all skill descriptions. Yeah. So proficiency ranks is super easy because it's just if you've got one point, you plus one, two points, plus two, three points, plus three, four points, plus four. Easy. Just easy to understand. Uh, all these skills, A, deduction, engineering, influence, major work, perception, stealth. Then knowledge-based skills, arcana, beast, body language, commerce, ingenuity, uh, medicine, obscure, performance, politics, religion, strategy, streetwise, and survival. They all make sense. They're all very short descriptions on the money. Perfect. Scribing uh, curios. So curios are uh interesting little things you can get it's a free reroll on something outside of battle that your character uh uses to better the odds of something major from their background which is a cool idea so it's like basically you always have advantage on stealth checks because you're a criminal growing up and you had to sneak into places and you can always just reuse those stealth checks all the time so that's i think that's kind of cool uh and then there is a fortunes table as well so roll your fortunes so uh, you can opt out of this, but I would not because it's part of the system. You might as well use it. Fortune table is really cool. Again, simple start off, great idea generation. So you could roll a d12 and get, I was swindled into buying some kind of estate. So like a tiny cottage, um, but it's, and the accessibility is a den for monsters, you know? So you swindled in buying a cottage, cottage, but it's a den for monsters. Something like that. It's cool. You mean you have a cottage, so yeah, but it's filled with monsters, so you, that's a whole adventure, right? Go and clear it out. Easy. Uh, the same again for developing contacts. So contacts again, very cool. Just roll your, you can roll all your contacts, figure that stuff out. If you don't like rolling, think of it from your backstory, make it up. That's all entirely up to you, but having the tables there to roll on, really, really helpful. Those three things together, the background, the fortune contacts, um, if you get them from wherever you might get them from, uh, they can sometimes be hard for players to come up with. And so having random tables to roll on is fantastic. And this helps the player find out who their character is as they're creating them. Plus, if you don't like what you rolled, you can just pick one, right? Like, I don't see why that wouldn't be an issue. Okay, so next we have uh, choosing a class. So this is really cool. There are class archetypes, right? It's a good way for players to get a quick understanding of what kinds of things classes can do without having to read the whole class. It's a very brief overview of what they get, what they do, what they're like. Very cool. Love it. Amazing. The classes themselves are not just the classic like fighter, barbarian, paladin. They have interesting, unique, and very cool names. Berserker. Justica, Strategist, Elementalist, Falconer, Cutpurse, Jester, Ferryman, Oracle, Ambergut, Magister. These are all cool names and they're a little bit of a twist on different ideologies that come about in the classes, which I think is really cool as well. Really, really cool. When you pick a class, you'll get uh, more health, a willpower score, and you will get classic stuff, classic class stuff as well, right? I'm not going to go through all the classes. You can kind of go through all that stuff at your own leisure when you guys decide to check out this uh, PDF. You can go and download it at uh, playdisrpg.com. Moving on to stats. So stats are much simpler. Choosing a class gives you subclass stuff at certain levels rather than specific subclasses. I think it's like more than enough 90% of the time to fit all that stuff in a class fantasy, but stats are even simpler, right? Stats are easy to understand, uh, but they don't, it doesn't really give you a sense of power fantasy that a lot of tabletop role-playing games do because the stats are a lot more simplified, right? So you get a stat at every level, but you can only level up that one stat once until the next like progression threshold, which is at level four, eight, and 12, right? So if you go from level one to level two and you wanna put your strength up, you can put your strength up, but you can't put your strength up again until you get to level four. So you're forced to like disperse your stats not fairly evenly, but at least semi evenly among the other stats as well, which is good and bad, right? Like it doesn't let you be that powerful one trick character that you might want to be. It kind of forces you to make more well-rounded characters, which isn't something all players want to do. So I'm not really sure if this is a good thing or not. Wanting your character to be super good at something early on is kind of like part of role-playing games in general where you're trying to like min-max or optimize your character 
so I'm not entirely sure. Also, Wisdom and Int giving extra skills seems a little bit overpowered until you realize uh, they have to take something they don't already know, right? Because you can't put more than one point in something until you hit those progression thresholds again, even with uh, skills. So basically, every time you level up, you can put another point in a different skill that you don't know already or that you haven't leveled up already from that level up. So again, it kind of forces you to be a little bit more like jack of all trades in a sense, but not necessarily. I think the bloodline abilities as an extra for the species that you choose are great, but should they should be placed in the same section as the lineages when you choose them so you can see them all there rather than have to get to the end of character creation and then see something you like and then go back and change it, right? So these are the different bloodlines, right? They're, they're basically like subspecies of the different lineages. And so you get an extra thing, right? But these extra things might be something you want to build your entire character around, right? So you might be a dwarf and then choose your class and choose all this other stuff. And then you get to here, you're like, oh my God, this elf, this elf ability, this elf bloodline ability looks so cool. And I have a really cool idea for a character based all around that. So maybe like, mention in the lineages section these also come with bloodlines have a look at the bloodline ability section here before you decide to choose what what uh, what lineage you actually want to play starting equipment equipment in this game i think is really cool there's some really cool ideas uh and there's some ideas that i actually really want to steal and put in some of my own games that's how good i think they are okay so you gain proficiencies uh for weapons from your starting equipment so it's an interesting take and it shows that what your character starts with is something that they know how to use. I kind of like this a lot. I feel like generally this stuff is placed in the background of the class, but placing it here allows you to basically choose a bunch of flavor, right? Which I think is really dope. I think it's really cool that like you can be like, hmm, you know what? I'm a dex based class, but I haven't got proficiency in like a light bow or a short sword. So you know what I think I'm going to do? I think I'm gonna go with like this pack and start with this one and like uh, get all this get all these proficiencies and stuff from it which is really cool I love that your pack has limited space but it does make carrying small things even more tedious you can like bundle things up um, for them to only take up one slot in your bag but basically you've got eight slots in your bag and that's it you can only have three bulky things and and the and the fact that you these bulky things can't be in your pack they have to be carried out of your pack it gives you a really cool sense of like seeing that adventurer that has like a shield and a and like some kind of hammer like strapped to his back while he's wielding like a short sword on his hip and like uh, and he's carrying a frying pan like like th those kinds of things that that's, gives a really cool aesthetic for that being overburdened with bulky items makes you encumbered which makes you move at half speed which kind of sucks i feel like the restriction of only being able to carry like three bulky items and then not literally just not being able to carry anymore i feel like that's enough i don't feel like it should slow you down because that just kind of like drags down even more because you, you literally just can't carry anymore so it's like if they want to pick something up they have to change something out rather than just, I have to throw these things on the ground so that we can run faster. Like, it's like, yeah, it makes sense, but like from a game perspective and quality of life perspective, it kind of sucks a little bit. Wealth might be oversimplified, but it is not a bad thing. I'm not too sure. So you have coin, you get a, like a coin tracker and you have like a, you have like not very many coins and things only cost like mostly like one, two or three coins. So you don't really have to spend a lot on stuff. Like if you scroll back up here for a second and look at the starting equipment, equipment section later, it's like two coins for a pack and the pack has survival tools, 30 feet of rope, oil lantern. There's these different packs. They only, they only cost like one, two coins, right? And then all these other stuff, like a mace costs five coins. That's pretty heavy. A war pick costs eight coins, pretty dope. But like a hatchet is like two coins. So there's not very many things that cost a lot. Plus when you get like a bunch of coins you basically chuck them in like a little pouch and it's called like a coin pouch and it contained like 20 coins or something and it only take it costs like takes up like one slot in your inventory or something like that it's, it's kind of fine but i think it may be a little bit oversimplified but then again you still have to keep track of it so different weapon tables look very well done uh and easy to understand uh, with which stat allows which weapon to be used so this is really cool uh, it's got how you wield it uh which stat it uses strength two strength three strength that's the minimum strength required uh there's also 
dex weapons and there's also int weapons very cool very easy to understand very good i like the variety armor buffing armor has a really cool unique uh maybe it's not unique i don't know but i haven't really seen it too much else anywhere armor has this really cool thing you can roll a dice that's added to that's a buffer on your armor to reduce the amount of damage you take but if you roll a one on that dice the dice degrades down it's called like a chain dice chain the, where the dice degrades down to a lower dice so if you if your armor buffer is like say full plates a d8 on a d8 if you roll an eight you'd mitigate the amount of damage you took by eight which is pretty substantial um, but if you roll a d on, on the d8 if you roll a one you would mitigate one damage and your armor has now been damaged in some way and you can only roll a d6 now when you try and buffer that damage again uh, you can only buffer damage once per damage is that right like once per attack i think so essentially you can't, it doesn't like chain on but the next attack you take if you buffer and you roll a d6 uh, and then the six, and then on the D6, you roll a one again, you still only mitigate one damage, which sucks. But then the, now that the armor has been even further depleted and you roll down to a D4 now. And then on the next time you take damage, you can roll a D4. And if you roll a one on a D4, your armor is broken. It's, you can't buffer anymore. Uh, rolling a one on a D4 compromises the armor, prevent it from being buffered damage again until it's repaired above the melee roll. So you just can't buffer again. Your armor still works as armor, but you can't buffer with your armor anymore. I really like this idea. I really like armor buffering i think it's really cool in the final check section we have it mentions death marks but it doesn't really say what they're used for or how they work other than a brush with death and if you have too many you die so it doesn't really mention any anything in here but just so it just says know them just know how many you have which is fine i guess because later on it tells you what they are and how they work but yeah okay the gameplay loop so we've got the path of play here we've got the basics of play running a session zero building an organization that's a dope idea playing the first adventure building your adventures character advancement and character retirement which uh, is also a cool idea. So the basics of play at the very beginning of this section are great for new players to tabletop role-playing games. This is just all pretty standard information that you probably want to know about playing the game in general. Building an organization. Building an organization together as part of a session zero is a very cool way to have all your characters know each other without the whole you meet in a tavern feel. And also I might just steal this for my table. <laughs> for making my own for my own campaigns because this is amazing so our organization specializes in prompt one espionage and prefers to be paid in prompt two contraband <laughs> we are known uh prompt three throughout the empire for uh defying the odds and uh applying political pressure most call us the grim bulwark there you go how easy is that that's such a cool thing to just take and be like yep this is the group of adventurers you are you guys know each other this is this is what you're known for this is how you do stuff this is it this is your motivation this is the start like it's amazing i really really love this it's really cool really really cool idea next we've got building adventures so i think this page right here for a lot of new dms is phenomenal uh this whole character story conflict and consequence as the three pillars of like how your how your adventures uh go forward is fantastic this is an amazing amazing thing um to use and uh i would highly suggest following these uh steps to try and figure it out if you haven't run an adventure before or if you haven't written your own adventure before it's really really good really helpful next we have the outline generator for new dms it's a way to again just simply figure out what kind of adventure is going to happen so very very easy premise uh you know your organization is looking for help to prevent a political event right so some kind of organization so let's look for uh, a known gang is looking for help to prevent uh, an uprising boom why is the gang trying to prevent an uprising who fucking knows but that's just how it is right like so you can figure that stuff out afterwards but though these this is a cool little interactive table um for outline adventures and there is also one for a battlefield generator which is really cool i think this is another really good tool that you've chucked in here uh to be able to help newer gms figure out just how to design encounters 
uh, once you've run this a few times, you'll probably start to get a feel for like interesting stuff and how it all works in together. He's got, you know, look, intersection, corridor, final box, bean, arena, like different shapes of maps and then different, different reasons for different things to be going on on those maps. It's really good. It's really, really good. The rate of level up seems pretty good. You need to complete X before your next level and X equals the next level. So it's a lot more time between the levels, the higher you go, which makes sense. But it's basically like session one or like, you know, trial when you finish a trial one, you get to level oh, two trials rather because you start level one. When you finish two trials, which are these like hardships or experiences that your character might have gone through, practically milestones. But, you know, once they finish those two trials, bam, you're level two. Then you have to finish three more trials and you get to level three and finish four trials to get to level four and then finish five trials to get to level five, six level six. And it's not, you've already finished two, so you get one more, so you go to level three because then you'd only ever have to do one to level up. No, it's the same amount plus. So basically when you hit level three, you'll have done, when you hit level two, you'll have done two trials. When you hit level three, you'll have done five trials in total, right? You essentially get like one trial every session almost, right? So it says here, at least one trial should be awarded and recorded on the character's progression sheet at the end of each session. The GM can make it a point to challenge the party in some way each session. However, the GM has double discretion over how quickly the process should actually move, given how often play, uh, how often you meet to play and a pace of your campaign. Awarding trials is meant to align with the pillars of character stories, conflict and consequence, which is what we mentioned before. For example, coming close to a permanent death, overcoming a grueling boss encounter, or attempting diplomacy in a no-win situation. Trials are also awarded while enduring hardship, not necessarily overcoming one. So you don't have to win to have gone through a trial and tribulation you can also do something called mentorship which is in downtime if character is like lacking behind the other players in the group you can get mentored and get that trial done and essentially tick that off their sheet and level up through downtime as well which is really interesting you gain skills in downthrone through experience gained via the trial system so you can gain skills without having to level up right so skills level up differently to how your stats do which i think is really interesting it might be slightly finicky to track if you've leveled something or not yet because these are these aren't like spent as such like when you level up you level up your skills different to when you level up your class i, might, I have to reread it again to really understand it but i did read through it and, I, and this is my my literal point was you gain a skill in downtime through experience gained via the trial systems you can gain skills without the traditional leveling up system which is kind of cool but it seems like it might be slightly finicky to track if you've leveled something up or not yet because those are not spent as such yeah, so you like gain trials so you gain like to get to level three you have to have three trials right you can spend these like trial points i guess you'd call them on like gaining skills but you don't actually spend them so you get three but you don't have but you don't have to spend them so you don't like record that you've spent them anywhere and then when you get to the fourth one it's like oh cool i'm at level four now i get another skill that i can learn during downtime because i have four trials done and now that I've got four, but did I use these ones? Did I not, did I do anything in downtime with these other ones yet? Like you might forget how it works. So that's that's kind of where I, that's kind of where my head at was, was while I was reading anyway. So health only increases at milestone levels, which is interesting because it makes it seem far more gritty, right? So milestone levels are four, eight and 12. So you only increase your health at those levels, which means your health is like pretty flat for quite a while and death in this game is very, very permanent so characters retiring to become a shopkeeper and then essentially turning your npcs for your other for like your new campaign or something pretty dope character retirement being uh, being that way is is really cool the fact that you can have people at different levels in the party and then they mentor others during downtime to help level them up is really interesting right so you know you could get ahead in levels because you went through more trials or something and then you could mentor the other people in your party and give them a trial essentially by just like you know talking to them about their experiences and then they could level up with you as well which is really cool Specialties are basically feats. They gained every even numbered level, but I would also like to see these somewhere closer to the character creation section, or actually all the character advancement stuff should be in the same section to make it easy to see what your character could become and work towards it. Uh, and a lot of people like planning out their characters, so having it all in one section does make it seem like it's a lot to lead through, read through initially, which could be intimidating, but uh, I'm guessing this book is mostly used by GMs. So having it all in one place is probably okay, but again, it might be a bit of an information dump to have all that stuff right at the start of the book in character creation. I do understand that as well. But And, and you know, the, the reasoning for having these things afterwards instead of at the front, I might just be missing something. And it might just be a design choice or it might be a very 
obvious kind of like psychological choice as well to have these things in a certain area too but that's just my opinion so the core mechanics for this game are it's a d20 pass or fail system but there is a sliding scale right uh not everything needs a roll if your character is good at something they shouldn't have to roll for it or if it's better for a story beat they don't have to roll for it right like the dcs here are sort of lowered compared to like say 5e where it's a dc 8 is just normal 12 is you know a fair challenge 16 is a difficult one and 22 is a very difficult thing to do a skill checks adding multiple of your skills plus your knowledge is a really cool idea that i wish was used more often so combinations that allow characters to shine right so there's some checks like a, like a skill check right here right where it says like a d20 plus the skill plus the knowledge and the example is you're in an ancient ruin the party is confronted by a magically locked door edgar wants to disable the lock and the gm sets dc at 16. Then they ask Edgar to roll a d20, add their mage work skill, which is relevant for magical door, and obscure knowledge, which is relevant for ancient ruins, right? So meaning that he could unlock the door fairly easily because he gets two skills added to his roll. Makes, makes a fair bit of sense to add two things to the same roll, right? Uh, initiative in this game is back and forth. Yeah, initiative back and forth, and I've seen more of this lately, and I think ultimately balances out the action economy problem that some other games have. The aggressing team, so whoever was more aggressive at the start of the combat takes their turn first, and the responding team takes their turn. If they're caught in surprise, then, you know, whoever is doing the surprising with the higher skills check versus the perception check, that's the team that goes first, right? I like the idea of non-violent resolutions when facing off against humanoids, but not so much against beasts or something else. This simple system is well done. Three successes or three failures, whichever one happens first. More successes in a row makes it easier. Uh, there are complications to everything that happened, right? So like flee, negotiate, demoralize. They're really good. I think it's great for, like I said, for humanoid uh, enemies, but for beast enemies and stuff like that doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense in that situation. A combat turn has a lot of options, which feels good. So you've got shake and effect, action, technique, you've got your reaction, your movement, and an at will ability. So at will abilities are like the free ability that you get in most TTRPG games where it's like, pick up an object, do a thing, blah, blah, blah. Then movement is movement, reaction is taken off your turn like always, or you can use it on your turn sometimes. Technique is basically your bonus action, right? Action is an action. And uh, shake and effect is a new thing that you can do, which is pretty cool. So you can basically try and get rid of a light condition that's on yourself. One negative effect or condition, you can kind of try and shake it off. So you roll a, roll a DC or whatever, right? This I think is a really cool thing to add because like a lot of the time, I'm gonna give my example in fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons here, but a lot of the time in D&D fifth edition, you are literally like, God damn it, I'm grappled, but I don't want to use my whole action to get out of this friggin' grapple. So I'm just going to stand here and stay stay grappled and just attack him with my sword, right? But it's like, if you had this extra thing that was shake and effect, you could try and shake an effect, like grapple away, and then be able to like do your turn like normal. And then maybe at the end of the turn, you do decide to move and blah, blah, blah. So I think the shake and effect thing is a really cool thing to add. I don't, like, and it probably wouldn't even come up that often, I guess, unless you were using a lot of different effects in your combats. So I think it's kind of cool. It's essentially, yeah, like you say in chat, uh, at the end of your turn, roll a wisdom save for blah, 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 right? It's basically that, but it's just at the, start, at the start of your turn or whenever you feel like doing it, you can you can do it then, so. Dice can be promoted and demoted, which is an interesting system. And I'm not sure if I like it because it might get a little bit confusing in the heat of battle and it might slow down the flow of things. However, I'm sure it feels great to promote dice, but it feels absolutely horrible to have to demote them most of the time. Uh, two weapon fighting versus a two-hander is thematic and great uh, that it is just one action to do either. And the damage difference isn't a lot because a larger weapon having a larger base damage, right? So with your action, you can attack twice if you've got two one-handed weapons, or you can attack once if you've got a two-handed weapon and you might think like well you're always going to do more damage because it's 1d6 and 1d6 plus your modifier or whatever but but no because the big hander does more damage and depending on the class abilities you've got does more damage and you might hit easier because it's strength versus dex so more damage like there's lots of things that go into it but basically it works it evens itself out pretty well so it's more of a flavor thing than anything else to be honest there is a neat little cheat sheet for weapon attacks somewhere here yep here we go cheat sheet rolling attacks so i think this is really cool super handy to have health willpower and character death 
I think this system is also really cool. Now, the death mechanic is interesting because it tallies up all the other near death experiences you've had in the campaign. And it just means that like this time that you get knocked unconscious really could be the last time that you're, that you're conscious. And I really like this idea. So it's a pretty big, and it goes up as you level up, right? It's a pretty big pool of like amount of times you can be knocked unconscious before you die. So it's five plus your character level plus your fort, which is basically like say your con mod, I guess. Five, level one, six, con mod, level one, might be a one, seven. So you've got basically seven times that you can get knocked unconscious. It doesn't work exactly like that, but seven times you can get knocked unconscious before you just die, you're just dead. And it stacks up, right? So like, if you get knocked unconscious like three times in the same combat, you're pretty close to fucking dead. So you better be careful. Right? So what happens is the way stabilizing works is you need to actually heal someone over the threshold of the amount of death marks that they have. And so the character could possibly be unconscious for a few rounds, but not forever, which I think is really good. Say you're unconscious and you've already had like two death marks. That means basically you have to be healed at least two to be like stabilized and then you'll be unconscious for like when stabilized the character remains unconscious for a number of rounds equal to the death marks minus their fortitude so death marks they've taken so if you're at like two and your fort is like one you'd be unconscious for at least one round uh, but if you've got like a plus three in your con mod or whatever right or plus three in your fortitude you're 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 basically canceling it out so you're only ever unconscious for like one round in that sense it's always at least one round but you are unconscious even if you get healed from zero over your thresh over your zero threshold, which it doesn't look like there's a negative HP in this game. It's like you go to zero and you're unconscious. Your health is set to zero, right? If you get hit while you're down, then you take damage. It's an automatic death mark again. When you get knocked unconscious, you gain a death mark, right? And then your health goes to zero and you're dying and you need to be stabilized. If you're not stabilized, you take another death mark. You can easily use aid or medicine to, to like uh, stabilize someone. And the thing is, after you take a death mark, you gain a permanent scar. And permanent scars are, you like cross off one of your maximum potentials from one of your skills. Uh, so instead of having like, say you're, say, you're, say there's like five ranks, or no, there's four ranks. Uh, for each skill and say you've got like two in stealth and it's like oh shit i almost died because i ran into a place by myself being stealthy and it's like well it kind of makes sense that maybe my stealth is going to get worse now so i'm going to knock off this maximum potential so even though i'm only at technically at two right now i can only ever go to three in stealth i can never go to four now because of this permanent scar that i have but permanent scars also bump your health up by one so you're less likely to die again in a sense. Death marks remove skill potential but gain health is an interesting way to scar the characters but also give them something in return that doesn't feel all doom and gloom. There's no revival baseline in this game and I love this. You you're, take your character's injuries more seriously that way, right? The day cycle of this game is broken down into three shifts essentially. So there's the morning shift, the noon shift and the night shift and that's like the three periods of time that you use. It's really simple uh, it makes telling the time of day easy because you can say it's either morning, noon or, or night. There are many more things the party can do in one day, but it is a lot simpler. So it might be too simple for some mechanical uh, and storytelling ideas, but it has as a baseline, it seems easy to understand for the players. So there's different downtime activities that you can do at different times of day. And there's also a good meal with friends, which is at nighttime. You basically sit down, long rest, do all that sort of stuff. Healing during any kind of downtime is fine too, uh, but you have to spend you know, a certain amount of time. So it's kind of funny too, cause like it's broken down into three shifts, but it's essentially like if you rest, that takes up an entire shift. So you, you spend the better part of like two thirds of, a, you know, a th you at least spend the better part of a third of a day resting at night, pretty much, which is true. When you think about it, you sleep for like eight hours out of a 24 hour cycle, right? That's a third of the day. Then the other two parts of the day, you essentially get to travel, fight, blah, 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 adventure, whatever, right? So where, where, wherever you break, end up breaking that up, it doesn't really make any difference, but yeah. Healing and other downtime activities seem well balanced and easy to understand. There's a long list of conditions. I guess it's fine. It just makes combat slower to need to remember all these different um, condition effects, I think. I mean, a lot of them are pretty self-explanatory, so I guess that's fine, but there is a pretty long list 
uh, of them. Crafting system looks cool. You can make weapons or armor of higher quality, which is definitely worth it when you get the benefits from not just the high quality gear, but you get the benefits from each previous tier of crafting uh, things of the same uh, level. So for example, if you craft something at excellent, you would also gain, you gain one of the excellent abilities and you also gain an enhanced ability and you also gain an improved ability. So you gain all three of these and you can pick whichever one you want when you make your thing, which is really cool. Uh, so imagine like crafting a shield and you cross an excellent shield so now it's got crushing and spiked and ergonomic bam you got three three things on your shield sick absolutely sick i love it looks really cool i think this would be great to implement somehow into 5e uh, as a crafting system and maybe they have uh, in the new books but we'll have to wait and see uh simple stat blocks for enemies is really good these are the stat blocks for enemies so it's tiny beast fragile fodder it's got one hp maybe eight variably uh, it's got a defense of eight. It moves twenty. Has a threat range of zero. It has a threat of plus zero, which means it rolls a plus zero to its dice rolls when it rolls to attack, uh, and its damage. And then it's got these four different things that it could do. You roll a d4, pick what you want, or choose what you want from the list when you're in combat. Really easy. It's like basically give it four different. Everything has like four different actions ish that you can just like pick through or roll through or whatever okay then we got magical spells and where to find them. So I'm not going to read through all the spells or lore. But maybe if I did a playtest, I would. But there are essentially spells cost invocations. Uh, and then you they're basically like spell slots. So done. That's my review of Distal. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Remember, uh, you can catch me on Patreon at patreon.com slash critical myths, where I've got a bunch of my own 5e supplement stuff up. Uh, you can go ahead and join as a free member. There's free stuff that comes out every single week. There's monsters, magic items, maps, as well as tons of different tips, tricks, bunch of links to my YouTube stuff and stuff I've got up on the DMs Guild. Go and check it out. Uh, don't forget, like uh, and also subscribe to the channel for more TTRPG reviews and 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons content. Well, I guess it's 5.5 now because, well, soon anyway. Ring that bell, says chat. Ring that bell. <laughs>